Hello, everyone, and welcome to NEMO's webinar, where today we will be having a conversation about the role museums play in supporting their communities. My name is Elizabeth, and I work for NEMO. At the Network of European Museum Organizations, um, our main activities are advocating for museums at the EU level, uh, providing training opportunities, providing a platform for museums to exchange and learn from one, one another, and helping museums to cooperate across borders. Today, we are looking forward to our uh, new approach to a webinar. We are having a conversation today sparked by John Folk and Judith Koch. Uh, Dr. John Folk is the director of the Institute for Learning Innovation and Emeritus C. Grant Professor of Free Choice Learning at Oregon State University. And Judith's career combines audience and learning research with museum leadership, building a better understanding of the changing role of museums today. So this conversation will explore the ways in which museums can build relevance and relationships with the different communities that they serve. Towards the end of the webinar, um, you will be invited to join our conversation directly. If you have a question or something to add, please alert us via the chat and we will be inviting you onto our virtual stage. If you're not comfortable joining on camera, you can also submit your questions in the chat and then I will present them uh, to our speakers. A recording will be made available after the presentation. And so without further ado, I'm going to hand this over to John and Judith to get started. Thanks so much. Good morning and thank you. And um, on behalf of the people that are here from North America, I just want to start with an acknowledgement that we are on the land of many First Nations and Native American tribes and we thank them for their stewardship of this land. But we're really excited to be here this morning. Uh, the concept of wellness is something we've been thinking about a lot at the Institute for Learning Innovation and particularly uh, with John's leadership as it's the topic of his new book, The Value of Museums Enhancing Societal Wellness. So in planning this session, we thought that over the last 14 months, we've, um, we're probably all a bit tired of Zoom meetings with PowerPoints. Um, and uh, so we thought we'd have a conversation. John and I will speak together first to introduce the topic. And then we'd like this conversation to include all of you. You know what's happening in your museums and in your communities. And I'm sure there's much wisdom across the group. So as we speak, if you like to think about your thoughts or questions or put them into the chat, that will help to inform the second half of this um, of this conversation. So first of all, good morning, John. Good morning. <laughs> and I know you've been thinking about wellness very deeply. Why don't you tell us what you think about um, when you think about wellness? Well, I'm actually not thinking of wellness per se. I'm thinking of well-being. Well-being. That's okay. Um, and it's important to appreciate that when, at least when I'm talking about well-being, I'm defining it quite differently than the way it has come to be sort of used in the vernacular, um, which is totally from a psycho psychological perspective um, and almost the notion of well-being has almost come to be seen in popular culture as a synonym for happiness. And although happiness is part of well-being, uh, it, it doesn't do justice to the concept. Um, so I view well-being as first and foremost an evolutionary mechanism, um, a mechanism that we, along with every other living creature on Earth, has evolved to provide survival related feedback. Feedback that in a Darwinian sense um, allows us to assess the fitness of our actions. So it's not just people that perceive well-being, it's also ants perceive well-being, oak trees perceive well-being, and even uh, bacterium perceive well-being. Now obviously they're not conscious um, and each organism perceives well-being in its own way, but it's a feedback mechanism. So obviously let's talk about humans so for example humans have emotions and um, have feelings like pain and pleasure and 
the evolutionary purpose of that, of those emotions is to, again, to give us feedback about our actions. So we learn to avoid things that cause us pain and make us feel bad. And by the same token, we actively seek out situations that we believe based on past experiences or occasionally recommendations by others that are likely to make us feel positive, feel good. Um, <clears throat> things like um, being loved by somebody, um, being given um, congratulations or um, being respected. Those are things that feel good. Um, actually, eating a good meal feels good. Um, um, and so these are fundamental aspects of what it means to be human. And their, the relationship between these perceptions of trying to avoid pain and suffering and trying to uh, actively do things that make us feel comfortable, secure, um, uh, sense of belonging, we've associated all kinds of behaviors with those kinds of things. And the reason that we do those is because actually over time, over evolutionary and cultural time, um, the people who avoid things that are bad and the people who um, manage to do things that feel good actually survive longer. Um, they live longer, happier, healthier, more successful lives. That's called evolution. Um, and again, unlike this sort of notion that um, is pervade in the popular culture, that well-being is something you can attain, almost as if it's um, something that you get once and for all. If we could only get there, we'd be great. Well-being is something that we're constantly striving for. And we it's an ephemeral thing that we achieve well-being. Um, and it feels great. And then, you know, we have to keep doing it because it fades. And so it's an ongoing process. Um, and we'll come back to this idea of well-being. Um, but speaking of definitions, one of the other definitions in our title is community. And so Judy, talk to us a little bit of, about community. Yeah, the community is a, another word that we that we all use and maybe mean something differently by. Um, it can also, uh, particularly in North America, um, it can also be a code word for um, those people who don't come to our museums. Um, and so uh, by community, um, I, what how the, I use the word community um, derives from uh, Peter Block, who had a very influential book called Community, The Structure of Belonging. And he really defines a community as the experience of belonging. <clears throat> and that core sense of belonging has two meanings. It's about having a sense of relatedness and being part of something, but it also means having a sense of ownership or being a co-owner of that community. And so I think about this definition of community a lot as I think about museology and the work of museums in their community, um, creating that sense, not just of welcome, but of exchange and power sharing. So if museums are really thinking about their community's well-being, um, we need to start by asking them what they what, what well-being means to them, what they need to thrive. And a project that John and I are involved in called uh, Science Museum Futures, uh, we did a community scan and we talked to people um, who, um, ac across the United States actually, um, and asked them about their community and what their community really needed to thrive in this moment. Um, and what we heard was um, needing a sense of safety, of, of work-life balance, now that work has moved into our homes to a great deal. We've heard about um, ongoing learning. My, I and my community want to continue learning about the world and 
myself. We heard a lot about people wanting to be good parents, both in terms of exposing their children uh, to learning, but also in terms of having a healthy earth for future generations. Um, we talked about, uh, we heard about equity, people wanting a less politically charged world and people wanting uh, a higher um, level of science literacy, understanding viruses, understanding climate change. Um, people talked about obviously financial security, people talked about access to an engagement in nature, and they talked about wanting to participate in a community, to give to the community, to help build that community. <laughs> Um, so that, can you talk a little bit, John, about museums and how they might think about these things that people, that communities are asking about and asking for? Sure. <clears throat> so all these things that people were talking about are, I would argue, expressions of different aspects of well-being. Um, so that people are talking about their security, which is related to their physical well-being. They're talking about trying to gain more knowledge about viruses that relates to their sense of control and their intellectual um, their intellectual control over events. That's their intellectual well-being. People are talking about <clears throat> um, their families and trying to do what's right for their children which relates to their social well-being. And then people are also talking about trying to, to have better work-life balance, trying to have a better sense of understanding of themselves, which is, relates to their personal well-being. And it turns out that people go to museums for all these reasons, because it ultimately all these types of well-being, as I suggested, ultimately relate to fitness, to their survival, to their sense of being able to be successful human beings, both within their own families, but also their communities and across their lives. So in a museum context, people say things like, museums relax and recharge me, or I learned a lot about myself today. Um, or they say that exhibit on X really satisfied my curiosity about that topic. Um, or my visit helped me build a stronger bond with my children. These are all examples of enhanced well-being, which again, I've categorized into these four dimensions of personal, intellectual, social, and physical well-being. And it turns out that this confluence of what museums what people take away from museum experiences and the, the data that we collected from some roughly 200 people across the United States through interviews um, have all converged on these four distinct categories because in fact, these are the four basic categories of well-being that all people strive for, that all people need. And the good news is that museums support those needs although not necessarily in the same percentages um, as the people in our interviews indicated. Um, we have a tendency to emphasize the intellectual well-being, which is fine. And most people um, uh, are very interested in their physical well-being and their social well-being. Um, and to a degree, their personal well-being, often to the exclusion of their intellectual, but that's okay. Um, so that's the good news. Um, we, whether on purpose or not, museums have gotten quite good at supporting and enhancing people's well-being. So let's let's segue there. And, and Judy, tell us a little bit more about how these ideas might relate to today's realities. Yeah, I, I, it's really interesting because we're not just talking anymore about people coming to our spaces. If, if anything, the pandemic has really uh, forced us as museums to connect with people in virtual in virtual spaces. And in fact, I um, I wonder if school visits will actually ever be ever be the same. A lot of the teachers and um, school leaders that I've been talking to 
really are speaking to uh, the need for these virtual visits so that we don't have to take time out of the classroom. And even if there is a field trip, bookending it with a before and after virtual activity. But um, I think museums have been working in this space of well-being in the virtual world, uh, particularly in this time when we have children at home and we're all feeling the angst and the stress of the pandemic. Um, this isn't entirely new. The Museum of Modern Art in New York has been doing online studio classes uh, for 15 years and um, they've actually been revenue generating for the museum. Uh, there's a museum here in Toronto called the Myseum, which doesn't have a physical space and so is in the community all the time. And they're doing their work, which is around building community for the city of Toronto, um, having conversations across difference. They're having that exchange in virtual spaces. Um, one other example um, is the Children's Museum of Long Island, which uh, because we're encouraged to go outside right now in small groups, um, has been posting a lot of family activities to do outside to explore the natural world. Um, for people that are interested, there's actually a great list that's been put together, at least of North American efforts, on the Museum Computer Networks website, and that uh, reference will come at the end of this discussion as well. Um, so art museums um, in uh, are have a well-developed program for Alzheimer's patients and their caregivers. So if you think about an individual with Alzheimer's and the person who is um, supporting them, their life is filled with loss on a daily basis. And being able to come into the museum for an art in the moment, they're usually called program, where um, visual art triggers memories and is a pleasant exchange and a discussion, um, is a real moment of positive exchange and bonding for people uh, at a difficult time. Another, uh, other art museums uh, that I'm aware of, oh, sorry, John, you were gonna say something? I was just gonna say that actually there's some wonderful examples of programs like that in Europe as well. Okay. Um, and um, which I know there's some important ones in the UK. I know uh, Demgamblebu in Denmark has been doing, um, uh, recreated a, a 1970s space where um, uh, individuals with dementia can spend the better part of a day basically being in spaces like when they were younger. And it's mm -hmm. had some amazing positive effects on the well-being of those patients. It's, you know, and it really is if we start with the visitors or the community and think about what they um, are looking for and need to enhance their well-being. And then we think about our mission. I think we can find a lot of intersections between what the community needs and, and what the museum has to share as a, as a resource. Um, I, I'm wondering too, though, about uh, business models. So um, this this also has to be sustainable in the long term. So um, do you want to talk a little bit about how you think about it with business models and sustainability? Uh, I would be happy to do that. <laughs> um, yeah, so I've been doing quite a bit of work in thinking lately about this whole issue of business models, in particular, um, this whole notion of demonstrating the value of institutions like museums. <clears throat> and uh, to the extent, my belief is that if we can understand the real value that museums provide, which again, I would argue is enhanced well-being, yeah. um, then we can, it should be possible to frame that in, in terms that poly, policymakers and funders and governments can understand. And as it turns out, the way to make that understandable is not merely through anecdotes and nice warm stories, but to convert that value into the language that policymakers and funders speak, and that's money. 
So the, the museum sector has long argued that they're essential organizations that deliver genuine value to their communities. And it's not for lack of effort on the part of museums um, trying to make that case, but recent history would suggest that the way we have tried to make that case in the past has not been all that persuasive. <clears throat> and as I say, for better or for worse, um, decisions related to value worth ultimately revolve around or perhaps more accurately devolve um, into issues of money. Specifically, policymakers want to know whether the benefits that accrue <clears throat> from the funding of a particular institution are truly worth the cost. And um, this calculus is typically referred to as return on investment. So um, return on investment, just to explain for a moment, is one of the most common ways that investors and policymakers and funders uh, evaluate the efficiency of, an, of a monetary exchange. And um, it's a standard way to measure performance. And it's basically a pretty simple model. It basically says that um, uh, you create a fraction, um, you can create a formula, and the top number, the numerator, is how much it costs to create that program or experience or to run the museum. And the bottom number is the value it generates. Um, and um, uh, actually, it's the other way around. The top number is the return on investment, and the bottom number is uh, the cost. Um, and um, obviously, the bigger the number um, that results, the bigger the return on investment. Okay. Now, in the business world, any invest return on investment of 10% or better um, is considered good, and um, that's generally true in the nonprofit world. Anything over 20% is considered amazing, which means that if you um, if you spent one euro for every euro spent on a project, you would hope to get at least um, one euro ten cents, one euro twenty cents back on that investment. So, what I have done um, with colleagues here and abroad um, is a pilot study to try and figure out, can we calculate the return on investment um, of the value, the enhanced well-being that um, uh, is generated by participation in museum experiences. And I, this initial pilot study was done with six different types of museums across three countries. There was an indoor, outdoor, nature and science museum in the US, a visual arts and cultural museum, that's actually my museum in Canada, um, a living history museum in the US, a state historical museum in the US, a zoo in Canada, and an interactive science museum in Europe, which was Herika in Finland. Um, and importantly, Unlike the way this is done, uh, value has been measured, this monetization efforts have been done in the past, I felt it was really important to um, collect data through two independent sets of data uh, from users. And I can go into detail why it's important to use two data sets. Um, but the first data set measured the benefits framed in terms of enhanced well being that um, museum users felt perceived they derived. And um, by and large, on average, um, people felt that they that they did in fact have enhanced personal, intellectual, social, and physical um, well-being. And of course, the, the relative ratio of those varied from museum to museum. Um, but interestingly enough, on average, people felt that not only did they have enhanced well-being, but that enhanced well-being persisted um, on again, on average, for at least a week or more. So going to a museum enhanced their well-being, not just in the short term, but over an extended period of time. 
Well, it turns out when you actually ask people separately, what is that worth to you? The longer you have enhanced well-being, um, the more value it has. And that um, if you combine those data, you can begin to see how you can convert perceptions of the value of well-being and the value of well-being enhanced um, directly to measuring the value of a museum experience, which on the uh, on average was about 345 euros per user per use. Well, think about that. 345 euros of value generated per use when the average admission charge to a museum, it may be free or maybe it's 10 euros, maybe it's 20 euros, but people are getting 345 or 350 euros in value back. And so when you start calculating out the return on investment, you get amazing results. So in interest of time, I'll just share three examples. So first, the History Museum in Nebraska, History Nebraska, um, which was the smallest museum with an annual budget of about $600,000. And, um, you know, with an order of magnitude of a couple hundred thousand visitors a year, they generated $10 million in um, value for those visits with a return of investment of $16,667%. Um, that means uh, for every dollar spent on History Nebraska, they were returning $166 in value. Um, the return on investment for Herica um, was 12,741%. So again, with a 11 million euro budget, um, they were generating um, 127 euro plus for every euro invested in that institution. Um, and interesting too, Myzeum, I mean, those, most of those examples were for, you know, a long visit. But I also, because uh, Myzeum was a virtual museum and runs virtual experiences, was able to calculate this for a couple hour workshop that they generated. So they did this workshop on First Peoples um, and they ran the workshop twice. Um, now, it cost combined a relatively modest, uh, roughly 3,500 Canadian dollars to put these two workshops on. And although it only served 197 people, the return on investment from that those two workshops um, was $211 Canadian dollars for every dollar spent. That's a huge return on, in, on investment. Anyway, you get the idea. And if you're, if you're thoughtful about the true value that museums generate and how we measure it, we can demonstrate that they deliver significant value and that they can stand up to comparison with virtually any other experience um, in a community, including public health, including public education. Um, and this is a strategy that we can use um, to argue the case for the value of these institutions. But maybe we should stop here and see if others have some questions or comments. We've talked for about a half an hour. Yeah. Wanted to open this up to a conversation. I, I just wanted to point out to you, John, I thought it was such an interesting observation. Stephanie Dragon, um, and I hope I'm saying your name properly, but she suggested <clears throat> return on engagement as a as an expression that she had I mean return on investment makes a lot of uh, people understand what that is but I kind of loved the return on engagement but yeah, yeah. let's open the floor um questions thoughts um what what uh, how would you like to build on this conversation so uh, the question oh. I asked in, in the comments was uh you know it seems like there's a distinction between museums that are functioning on an attractions model and more of a service model in terms of 
whether it's the, the, what you're looking at is government funding and grants as the basis for the return or an admissions charge. And I'm so wondering how that affects your understanding of um, where the value is um, in terms of those two models. Sure. <clears throat> so first of all, in terms of calculating <clears throat> return on investment or return on engagement, um, what what you're looking at, since you're converting this to money, is um, the total benefit derived as a function of the total income required to create that benefit, independent of how you generated the income. And so um, whether it's through government funds, um, which in fact in the case of the Myzeum was the case, um, um, or if you're talking about admission charges, which in a case like um, Herica, a good percentage of their income comes from admission charges. So those are, those are independent. And <clears throat> although I didn't talk about the, the inner workings of this calculation, um, the fact is there are two ways to generate value. Um, value increases um, both as a function of quality and as a function of quantity. And so um, it's not either or, it's both end. And so you can increase the value generated. Um, you can have a minimally valuable experience that um, lots and lots and lots and lots of people have, which is more of an entertainment model. Or you can go the other direction. <clears throat> you can create an amazing experience that people feel um, generated unbelievable value for you for a relatively small number of people, which is what the Myzeum did. Mm -hmm. um, um, now, obviously, you could try and do both, which museums claim they try to do, but it's really hard to do both, right? Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for this um, excellent here. presentation. Um, I would like to, I'm a little bit familiar with your work. I've been uh, reading as much as I can, but I have not found this report with the um, details on the estimation on the return of investment. So it would be lovely if you could, uh, I'm sure this will be on the references later on. And um, my question is actually very specific on the learning part. I really appreciate your discussion on learning and how, if I understood correctly, we learn what we are ready to learn. So it's a process of continuous learning. And when you go to the museum, whatever your mind is uh, ready to catch, that's what you will take with you. And um, I'm, I'm really curious about this process and particularly I'm thinking of museum shop. So how is your experience on the objects uh, provided in the museum shops in terms of their educational potential and perhaps, you know, this continuation of the museum experience? Okay, so three questions. Let's see if I can remember them. Um, so first of all, um, uh, this is new. Um, so literally there was a blog. Uh, I've been writing in a series of blogs. I've been uh, trying to be totally 21st century about this and spend less time writing academic articles that uh, all of uh, 50 of my nearest and dearest friends read and trying to um, communicate more through blogs as well as books, which have a, a broader audience. Um, so, uh, if you go to the Institute's website, you will see um, this return on investment as well as a couple other blogs that I've written over the last six months that begin to talk about these ideas. And then as Judy mentioned, I have a book forthcoming um, end of this year, which will lay out these ideas um, in more detail. Um, <clears throat> so that's, that's the plug for that. Um, so learning, um, as, many of you may know, uh, I have spent uh, the better part of my career, um, which is rapidly pushing a half a century now, I dare say, um, framing the museum experience through a learning lens. And, um, and that was the prevailing paradigm and still is a major paradigm. Um, <clears throat> I have come to believe that learning is a means to an end. Uh, it isn't the end. Um, people learn because it enhances their fitness, to be honest. It brings them pleasure. 
um, which is fitness. It gives them a leg up in the world, which is fitness. Um, it provides um, opportunities to them in terms of their relationships and their professions, uh, which again is about fitness. So museums do support learning, um, but I think the deeper purpose of that learning is has to do with their well-being. But that said, um, museums clearly support learning, but it is like the proverbial, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. Um, people learn what they find engaging and interesting and intriguing to them. And obviously museums invest a lot of time and energy as appropriate in introducing people to ideas and topics. Um, and they have an obligation to do that. Um, but you can't force people to learn things that they're not ready or interested in. Um, but you can make it, you can open people's eyes and engage them in ways that they hadn't thought about. Um, so it is, it is a dynamic. Um, it isn't the old traditional model, you know, we just open somebody's head and pour the, the knowledge in. But you can create pathways to learning. You can make it easier or you can make it harder. And it begins with creating um, <clears throat> connections for people's lives so that people can see how these new information and new experiences can connect to their interests, to their lives. And um, so obviously I can talk about learning for further, but let me get to your third question. And again, I, I don't know if I've done justice to your second question, but shops, um, shops too, um, are a way for people to satisfy their well-being. And um, they provide sometimes long-term durable experiences for people. I, I interviewed a woman about her museum experience and she told me about um, because it was salient to her because she just recently worn a scarf that she had bought at a museum um, a couple years earlier. And that scarf, turns out it was a Frank Lloyd Wright scarf. Um, it was given to her by her husband as a gift after they visited a Frank Lloyd Wright house. And every time she wears a scarf, it brings back memories memories of the museum, memories of her husband because it was their anniversary, memories of uh, they were visiting her sister and her family. And so again, we tend to minimize the gift shop, but it's a really critical way of building relationships. And potentially if we played the ga this game right and think of it not merely as, um, you know, the for-profit people do as a way of generating money, but we can think of it as a way of extending the experiences that we want to create, the well-being that we want to provide to the public. Welcome, Martin. And just before we jump to your question, um, there is a question in the chat about thinking about value on the community scale. And this work's been very early and we've been starting with individuals, but I'm assuming that if you can establish a value on uh, average across a group of individuals, you could then use the attendance as a multiplier uh, for the community. Is that what you're thinking? That is correct. And again, I think it, as we begin to think about the future of museums and begin to think about the value that we create, not merely by who shows up at our front doors, but how, how we extend into those communities <clears throat> and try and take the skills that we've developed at enhancing people's well-being and reach out to increase the well-being of others. Um, including those who don't just come to our institutions, but as a tool that we can provide to enhance the well-being of uh, particularly the most needy in our communities, I think um, this could be a great thing. Yeah. Yes, Shane Clark, I hope that that got to your question. And Martin, why don't you jump in? Thank you very much, Judith and John. Um, and thank you very much for going into this, this question. I think it's very important that our value is actually measured, they've measured so many things, and, and why don't we start measuring this a bit more? And John, I would like to ask you if you could elaborate a bit more 
how you came to these 345 euros per per visit and and what um as a how how strong is the method and can you as a how can we uh, is there any ways that somebody maybe could argue against the method you have have used <laughs> could just elaborate a bit more how you have I figured out that is the value of a museum. Visit. Sure, thank you, Martin, and lovely to see you. And of course, Martin is the person who's responsible for the for the good works at Demgamblebu, which I gave a plug to in terms of patients with dementia. Um, <clears throat> well, so first of all. I guarantee there will be people who have problem with my methods because no matter what method you come up with, no matter how you slice and try and um, quantify. Uh, whatever it is that you're trying to quantify, um, it's uh, there are imperfections. But um, I believe that the approach that I've taken is sound. Um, so without spending an hour on the method, the gist of it is saying, first of all, um, historically, the way people have measured well-being um, there, um, there are significant flaws in the approach. First of all, because the way people have traditionally measured well-being um, has been based purely on, um, I would argue, a flawed model of well-being, this notion of happiness, for example. And, and people are often asked, so tell me, you know, there are annual surveys of well-being. So tell me, you know, what's your well-being like for this past year? And I'm, I'm here to tell you, you can't answer that question. I can tell you what my well-being is today. And if you really push me, I'll give you an answer of what, how I felt yesterday. But well-being, because it's ephemeral, is always relative. So it's a question of how I feel today compared to how I felt yesterday. Um, so generic answers are not very useful. So what I strive to do is look for metrics of well-being that are not generic, but are specific to museum experiences. And the good news is that we actually have a really, really good data set for that. Um, we haven't framed it that way, but as you know, uh, I and many others over the last couple decades have spent a lot of time trying to understand why people go to museums and what people say are the benefits they take away from them. And inherent in that, I mean, those statements I read, you know, it made me feel comfortable. I learned more about myself. It made me feel good about my kids. Um, so those are the very concrete kinds of dimensions that we can actually measure as enhanced well-being because those are the direct benefits that accrue from these experiences. So using those methods, I was able to fairly accurately, I believe, and reliably measure the outcomes of museum experiences and ask people to assess the duration that those, that those kinds of feelings persisted. An hour, not at all, an hour, a day, a week, a couple weeks, whatever. But then you can independently ask people, so what would that be worth to you? What would an hour of feeling safe and secure be worth to you? What would a day's worth of being safe and secure be worth to you? What would a week worth of feeling safe and secure be worth to you? What about two weeks? And although that's difficult, people can put a dollar euro value on that. And then actually you can combine those two sets of data to get to this, which is how I've, that that's basically the gist of the approach. Thanks. Hi, thank you Hi. so much for your talk. It's been so interesting. Um, so my question was, um, if you would consider approaching the climate change as a social, a social well-being, and also what would be the, best approach through the communities to tackle this issue? And, and actually now I have a, a third question. That is, do you think there will ever be financial return when we are talking about climate change? If museums will ever have any financial return on that? Um, good question. Topic, um, I know. <laughs> so, so what I would, again, what, 
I would argue, and again, people can disagree with me on this, um, um, is that if we think of our institutions, first and foremost, as institutions committed to enhancing societal well-being, then climate change is an example of societal well-being that we need to focus on. And so um, what that then says, how do we do that? Now, I'm, I'm not prepared to answer that in 20 words or less. <clears throat> but again, I would make the case that it is totally appropriate as a goal for the institution to take a problem like that and think about it through the lens of well-being and think about the contribution that a museum can make to that. And it's important to frame it as a contribution. Museums are not going to solve um, climate change, but they can contribute to that. And so the question is, how do you contribute to that? And I believe, and this is really the premise that I began this whole process and how I came up with trying to figure out a way to measure and then ultimately monetize this. If you can define what it is you're trying to do, if you can define how you contribute, then you can find a way to measure that contribution. And if you can measure that contribution, then you can also put a dollar value on that. None of that's easy, but it's all doable. And it is the kind of thing that we should be doing and how we should begin to use information like this to change the focus and, in fact, the mission of museums. I agree. Thank you so much for your answer. That, that's very inspiring. <laughs> Thank you. There, there has been some talk in the chat, John, about um, about people with really serious needs for whom learning and um, nurturing creativity, you know, they're still worried about clean water and uh, and <clears throat> particularly the example given was First Nations groups here in, in Canada. But I feel like you sort of responded to that in terms of saying we can't be the problem solver, but we can be the, we can be a contributor. Yes. But, Katarina, nice to see you again. Hello, Judith. Hello, Joe. Nice to Hello. meet you. Hello. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a question for you. I would be very interested for your opinion. Uh, there is a growing field of um, research on health humanities and arts in health and uh, the well-being part uh, being connected uh, with mental health and the therapeutic uh, part. Mm -hmm. a therapy and the therapeutic value also of collections and museum objects. Um, have you made any research from that perspective? Well, again, I think <clears throat> these are clearly examples of how museums have worked to try and support at least um, one aspect of well-being. And um, I can't, this kind of research that I'm talking about is in its infancy. And so I, I certainly haven't specifically collected data on that. Um, there is data on that shows that museum experiences can increase people's um, sense of physical health and well-being, um, which is, I think, um, evidence in support of what I'm trying to say. Uh, I will say that historically, um, again, um, you know, take it with a grain of salt, but my opinion is that often the way we have measured even things like physical well-being have been problematic in the past. We've traditionally used a deficit model. Um, people in the health profession talk about well-being as the absence of of illness as opposed to being more of an asset-based approach that actually you never are, I mean, um, health again is always relative. Um, I am healthy 
or unhealthy compared to how I was yesterday, not the way I was 30 years ago, because how I was 30 years ago or even a year ago is irrelevant because it's a moving target. We all, you know, life is a dynamic thing. And the goal of life is not to live 30 years. The goal of life is to survive for another minute, for another day. And so um, we should be thinking about well-being as the efforts and value of the things we did today that supported the quality of our life today. Um, and that's a really different way of looking at it. So if you do that, then um, it puts some perspective on the programs. So what we should be that you're talking about. So if we made people's lives better today and a little bit better tomorrow, then we are making significant contributions to people's well-being. And again, that's what we should be striving for and that's what we should be measuring. Thank you very much, John. Could I, could I ask one more question? Uh, in terms of how we can measure well-being, for example, uh, UCL has a well-being uh, toolkit uh, that they use in their programs. There is generally an effort to develop such kind of toolkits in order to measure well-being. Uh, would you recommend, make any suggestions on that? Well, first of all, I am not. <clears throat> I can't claim to be familiar with UCL's well-being toolkit. It's just an example, an indicative yeah. example. Yeah, and so, so I can't specifically talk about that. I know um, the work, much of the work that's been done in the UK has um, attempted to create correlations with their annual well-being surveys. And again, I, I'm not a big fan of those. I think yes, that's they- that's why I'm asking, yeah. Because if that UCL toolkit is predicated on that, those kinds of measures, then I think they're flawed. Um, they, they, they're better than nothing, but I don't think they get at the heart of what I'm talking about here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Would you recommend any tools to, um, for further research, exploration? I, I think um, stay tuned. We're, we're working on it. Okay. But I don't... Okay um to to be developed <laughs> okay thank you very much you're welcome okay. thank you interestingly um someone did raise the question of um the of measuring the opposite so uh you know what what is life like with less culture uh the absence mm -hmm. of of culture so uh it's sort of an interesting um mm -hmm. yeah comparison yes um and I mean, the only thing I would say in that respect is that um, if you take to heart the model that I'm proposing, that the pursuit of well-being is an inherent, um, a fundamental human quality. All humans strive to for enhanced well-being. Mm -hmm. And by and large, <clears throat> Um, we're all pretty damn successful at it because um, if you believe in evolution, every one of us, every person on this call, as well as virtually every person in the world is the product of ancestors who achieved well-being <laughs> because on average, um, they were the fittest and they survived. Because if they didn't achieve well-being, they wouldn't have survived to reproductive age and they wouldn't have reproduced and we wouldn't be here today. So we are all the progeny of people who managed to achieve at least a necessary level of well-being. People seek well-being in different ways. Now, we tend to believe that our well-being can be enhanced by museum experiences. And most of the people who show up at our institutions or partake in our programs share that value. Yeah. But not everybody shares that value and they look for well-being in other ways and other places. And so um, how we, so we need to be more asset-based and rather than deficit-based. Okay. So yeah. just because people don't share our perception of culture and well-being doesn't mean they don't have well-being. 
and they don't achieve well-being. Yeah. Um, and so if we want to expand our audiences, we need to find out how other people perceive well-being and what it is that they they have done in the past to achieve well-being and how can we support that? And it may or it may not look exactly like what we've done with um, our current audiences and our current publics. Great. Chris, I welcome. We, I think we have time for one more question. Yeah. And you get it. And you get it, Chris. Great talk. Thank you very much. Um, you're you're talking about the big picture, and I, I fear I'm going to talk about the granular, maybe, um, yeah. not to lower the tone of the conversation. But I'm curious about how in museums the use of foreign languages, use of multiple languages within a museum can draw in a more diverse community and the utility of this and what's the maximum number of languages. I should specify that I'm a translator myself uh, <laughs> and I have students who seem just totally fascinated by museums, would like to specialize in museum translation and I would like to know what kind of things I can give them to read. Are there statistics available about greater community use of a museum? Um, I know I've sat myself in museums and watched people using the museum and seen that oftentimes people don't necessarily read the information. And I was going to say, as this is a great opportunity for bookends. This is Judy's question. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so um, Chris, there is research that shows, um, particularly in communities with um, high numbers um, of certain language groups, that um, having materials available in alternative languages increases that sense of belonging, right? That sense of, oh, I see myself here. Um, there's also, however, evidence that um, and, and I'm sorry to say this to a translator, but that translation isn't always the best approach, that a, a native speaker recreating the key messages rather than translating from one culture, just exchanging language, isn't always the most effective approach. So that's what our research has, has shown. So thank you for that question. Okay. But I, I think we're at the end of our time. I think um, we are. Yes. And we could go on, but we won't. <laughs> yeah, but so it was so great to have a conversation. Yes, across. it it was fun. Um, and you can you can be honest. Um, but do you have just two minutes? Because there was someone who put a question in the chat, and I promised to verbalize it. Of course, two okay. extra minutes. Yep. Okay, because I, I also minutes. personally found this um, question very interesting. Um, it said here, I'm interested in the notion of well-being, and it seems that it's mainly been talked about as an individualized notion. Um, given that museums are civic, social, and public spaces, can we think of well-being in a more collective way? We can. Um, again, I would say that at the moment, the approach that I have um, particularly focused on is more at the level of the individual. But the wonder of the way um, humans in particular are focused, but other living things have been, um, we tend to create these super organisms, which, um, you know, you can think of a, a, a beehive, a community of bees or ant colony, and certainly humans are super social. And um, I, I think it would be great to begin to think about how we could begin to define well-being in more of a community and social context. Um, and I, I would be happy to talk to anybody about that topic. And again, I, I wouldn't claim that, that I have the answer, but I'd love to think about that with others. And it should be absolutely possible to frame this in terms of collective well-being rather than just individual well-being. No, I, I completely agree. I think it's also, I, I think it opens up so many interesting avenues for, um, you know, discussing the collective well-being, especially in cases where museums are dealing with difficult topics, for example, just, I don't know, I think, yeah, we could go on. But as yep. you said, can't. <laughs> but um, <laughs> this, uh, this was really a fantastic conversation. Um, it was such a pleasure for us uh, hosting you here. And I mean, 
it was very clear from uh, the questions coming in. I think everyone got a lot out of this. So um, yes, thank you both so much for your time and uh, for sharing this wonderful conversation with us. You're welcome. And thanks thank for making you. it possible for us to do that.